wonderful, and today is Andrew's last Sunday with us before he goes to the great Northwest. Mm -hmm. Excited for you. You're going to Eugene, right? Oh, beautiful town, wonderful place. We're going to miss you. And, and if you can find the time, seriously, drop us an email and let us know how you're doing. I think we need to give you a round of applause. Very, very happy for you. And also are happy for the choir and all the good work that they did this year. This is their last Sunday, of course, till what, in August or something like that? September? Okay. And we want to thank them. And also we want to thank uh, Kim ji of course, for the good work that she did as well. Please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, clap for you. Oh, all right. Uh, speaking about the choir, I think some of you can remember uh, there was a guy that used to sit back near where uh, Angel and Brenda uh, are sitting, and this is about 10 years ago, and he had this absolutely wonderful voice. And it was a big guy, a handsome man. His name is Bob McGee. And he was a Presbyterian minister, and, uh, and eventually, uh, the, the choir recruited him, and he sang in the choir. Wonderful guy, wonderful, wonderful man. And he was the admissions director at IU for a while. And anyway, uh, he, he had a wonderful time in this church. He was my colleague, and we spent a great bit, bit of time together. Anyway, he died uh, about a week ago, and his uh, wife gave me a call and asked if we would do a memorial service for him. And we are doing that, in fact, on Saturday the 25th which would be this coming Saturday, and it'll be here at noon. And if anybody remembers Bob or would like to uh, pay their respects, then you certainly are uh, more than encouraged to do that. We, we miss him. He's a, a good guy, um, a, a really good guy, and he had an interesting story to tell, and maybe we can talk about that at that time. You have the other announcements. Uh, um, today's Pentecost, the giving. We'll do that, as you see in your... Uh, bulletin, and I think Don Root has something to say in just a second, but well, I'll go ahead and say it now, and then. Morning. 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 I think we're all familiar with the per capita assessment. Uh, it's uh, something we pay as a church to support the governing bodies of our denomination, the Presbytery, the Synod, and the General Assembly. And every year we ask those members who are able to pay their own uh, portion of the per capita, which is uh, currently $29.33 per member. We all like to know where our money goes. Uh, and the General Assembly has put together this packet uh, that kind of breaks down their portion of it. Uh, the part that goes to them is uh, $6.87 and uh, they uh, in this packet they, they tell you know what the, what it supports and uh, a lot of things about it and Alejandra was able to obtain some of these packets from General Assembly. We're going to be passing them out uh, on the way out after church. And I would urge you to just take it home, spend a few minutes going through it. I, I think you'll find it very interesting and informative. Thank you. A couple more announcements. We will be bringing new members into the fellowship on the 16th of June from our communicants class, so I want to draw that to your attention. And finally, I think everybody got uh, the letter from me, didn't you, this uh, this last week? What and uh, what is that, the what best letter? unkept secret in the world? <laughs> it's time for me to retire. I have to announce that from the pulpit, and we have to have a pastor, pastor. We have to have a special congregational meeting uh, on uh, Sunday, June the 2nd. That'll be immediately following the service. It will, uh, it will be to dissolve the pastor relationship um, uh, in effective 
at the, at the end of December, but in reality, uh, um, on July 31st. That's the only business that we'll, we'll be discussing whether to dissolve that or not. So that's on the second. Should take about five minutes, and then we'll go have a fellowship hour. So that is the first of the two announcements regarding my retirement that need to be made. Now, with that said, Michelle, glad you're here. We'll begin with silence. Reconciled us to himself through Christ, 
For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Thank you. All right, we have the children's here today. Uh, hey, you notice anything different up here today? Anything different? The flowers. No, well, the flowers are different. Hi, what's different? No? Mina. Mina. Ah. That's what I said. No, I said meaning to you. I said meaning. Are you a meaning? <laughs> Not what I heard. Is that M? Is that red? Oh, I should have said N instead of M. Oh, it's the red thing. Yeah. Oh, the red thing. Meaning. <laughs> what? Why do you keep on saying meaning? I don't know. I like it. It's a that's pretty red. name. That's red. It's red. What's it stand for? Ah, you don't know, caught you. Do you, have any idea? <laughs> you know why we have red up there? I wonder why. What What are some of the things that are red that you can think of? What? Apples. Apples, exactly. <laughs> yeah? Can you think of other red things? Quiros. Quiros are sort of red, yeah. What? Jesus Christ forgiving us like his, like when he got crucified. Yeah, okay, so it could remind you what? What, what's red in your body? Blood. Okay, it could remind you of blood. What else? Blood. What else is red sometimes when you <laughs> when you look? When, how many of you, have, you ever go out in the woods and start a fire? Is fire! A, fire is red sometimes. Yeah. That's right. Well, today in the church, we do it once a year. It's called Pentecost. You ever heard that word? Pentecost. No? no? You never heard? Well, I'm not going to tell you what it means. Pentecost. Well, it's a time, a lot of people think it's a time when the church sort of began. Like I, Some people call it the birthday of the church. I know. I don't think that's really exactly right. But Pentecost. Anyway, it's a time when something really special happened. Do you know what it was? You do? What was it? Oh, how old are you now? Three? Two? One? Are you one? Two? How old are you? 18? Eight. You don't look 18. I said I'm 8. <laughs> oh, I thought you said I was 8 up. Mm. Uh, Pentecost. Anyway, it's a time oh, when... I think I know. Okay. Uh, does it mean when Jesus gave everybody the Spirit? Oh, does it mean when Jesus gave everybody the Spirit? Exactly right, young man. And what does that mean? Yeah, well, what that means is, think of it this way. This is really cool. Let's say you have a car, okay? To make the car move, what do you have to put in it? Yes. Gas. Gas. And it's like, with the spirit, it's like gas. And you've got, a, you, you, you've got the church, and the church is like a car. And so for the church and Christians to be able to move and do nice things, what do you have to have inside of you? The spirit. The spirit. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's listen to the choir sing much better than what I just said, okay? <laughs> oh, children's song. Andrew, play through it once, please. Who's singing with me?
much. Now we'll listen to the choir, okay? <coughs> Concerns of the Church Universal and uh, Church Particular. I think, um, Fod, were your prayers answered this uh, year? Did you make straight A's? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, not. But uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it was good enough. <laughs> One B. That's a lot better than I did. <laughs> I, was a I, I was a slow learner. I, I was. 
took me, not that you care, but it's kind of instructive. Uh, I, I made straight C's my first two years of college <laughs> and almost straight A's the last two. I just had to figure out how to study. I had to figure it out. And once I figured it out, and then graduate school was really easy. Um, but uh, that's good for you. Good for you. Congratulations. Proud of you. And you're here for the summer? Uh, about two and a half more weeks. And, and then where? We're going to London. Oh. And we're gonna, I'm going to live now for a little bit, and then I'm going back to Emory. Good for you. Wow. All righty. Any prayers that we need to lift up, Swale? Prayers of thanksgiving for my dad is back home and he's doing okay. <clears throat> I spoke with Bud. Um, he's uh, doing marginally better and improving, but not quite where he needs to be. So please remember him in your prayers this week, yeah. as always. And Lucinda, too. It's, it's been uh, tiring, I think, I'm, for I'm, both of them. And, and, and they send their hellos to everybody. They miss you. I would like prayers for Michelle Deschavon. She and George from France often came to church, right. and George died oh, no. yesterday morning. Oh, no. He was 92. Oh, wow. Very fine people. And longtime friends of the Watts, weren't they? 40 years. 40 years. Okay, well, we will do that. And please tell her that we'll be praying for her and lifting her up. And Okay? Yes, Alan. Um, my cousin's husband, his name is Glenn Ganta, and they live in Mountain Home, Arkansas, and he went into hospice on Wednesday, and um, just before the service started, I got a communication from him. Um, his mind is still clear, but everything else is deteriorating, and he specifically asked that we pray that he be taken soon. Uh -huh. <clears throat> My mother's going to have surgery probably next week for blocked arteries. Okay. I have a friend in the new pastor's program whose wife is last week. They're very young. Um, she had a heart event and needed to be in an induced coma, and <coughs> they brought her out um, slowly, and she's doing well. Um, they were concerned about her brain function, but mm -hmm. she's doing really well. And, um, I just ask prayers for that family. It's, it's been a really good Give a first name? Um, Amanda. For Ruth Young. I'm sorry? For Ruth Young. <coughs> and for my family. For us. We need prayers so we can take the wise decisions that we have to take during the summer. Mm -hmm. Let's turn our attention to prayer. <clears throat> Gracious and heavenly God, we thank you for this wonderful morning and for this springtime of our contents. We give thee thanks that you are taking our, our students away from us and back to us and then away from us. They can grow and learn even as we did when we were their age. I'm grateful that um, Aida is in Colorado and preparing for uh, uh, Costa Rica and I'm grateful that Sammy is in Lebanon and I'm grateful that Yasmina will be um, at our camp and uh, this summer and grateful that uh, uh, Fouad is back with us only to leave us and to come back to us. And we give thee thanks that our, our children are maturing and they're able to leave and come and come and leave and that they know that, th that this place is sacred. And they're always welcome and that this place is safe and they'll always be healed. So, we thank you for them. We also thank you for their parents for letting them go. We ask that you continually be with your servants, Bud and Lucinda, in what has been a long, long time of illness. 
And we would ask that you would restore um, Bud to a measure of good health, that he could um, be back with us. And we're mindful that, uh, that the care uh, givers uh, wear down and, and suffer um, greatly as they're taking care of their beloved ones. So we ask that you abide with Luke Lucinda and give her the strength and the um, wherewithal as she takes care of uh, her, her beloved. We ask that you be with um, Glenn in Arkansas and, and that we do not presume to know what is best for him, but we would ask that what is best for him um, is that he be held in your hands, O oh Lord, and that perhaps it would be your will that you would uh, return him to you and that his suffering would, 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 would be no more. I'm grateful to pray for CC and her upcoming surgery. Let her take this as an opportunity to understand your closeness and that you're with her. I ask that you continue to be with Ruth Young and we continually give thanks to God for the ministries um, that have been showered upon her by the Lormers, Bob and Sue. We ask that you be with Sarah's friend Amanda in this time of strangeness and that you would guide Amanda through this, this interesting adventure and that she would come out of it stronger, more focused if she needs to be and more in love with you. We ask that you be with um, Michelle and George from France, old friends of this church, 40-year friends of the Watts. We lift up to you the life of George as he has passed on to be with you. We ask that you be with his beloved as she mourns the loss of her husband. We ask that you abide with Patricia and Victor and that you guide them through these waters that they're going through right now, that they be not afraid, rather that they take these uh, these times is an opportunity to, to get to know you even better. And that when that employment opens up, that they will smile and rejoice. And I would pray for them that it comes soon. We pray for our country. We pray for our leadership. We pray for the loyal opposition. We pray for those that we have harmed and ask that we be forgiven. For those who is, that have harmed us, that we forgive them as well, even as we were forgiven by Christ Jesus. But ask that you abide with us now and that you hear this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And it is not in the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. We continue now with the sharing of our tithes and our offerings. Mm -hmm.
gracious and merciful God, to you only do we give our praise and adoration. With your mighty hand, you protect us. With your word, you teach us. And with your spirit, you guide us. Blessed are we to know these truths about you. Lord, we pray in earnest that this part of your body, this church, can go forth and share your truth with sin saints and sinners alike. We ask your blessing on these humble tithes and offerings to this end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, before I start today's scripture reading, today's or this week is also special, not just because of Pentecost, because it's a very special person's birthday. So please join me to get together in singing Happy Birthday to Marion. Sue. Oh, two special people this week. <laughs> Sue Lorimer also. Eddie. in your pew Bibles, Exodus 19, verses 1 through 19, and in the large print, page 113, and then Acts afterwards. The giving of the law. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai, after they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be a kingdom for me of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they go up to the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, and a thick cloud over the mountain, 
and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord descended on it in a fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. And from Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 21. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pull up, pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God bless this reading of his holy word. Michelle, that was a good uh, prayer. Do you want this back? No. <laughs> Always go with the good stuff. I originally was going to not use my notes on this morning's meditation, and then I got to thinking maybe I'd better. Because I, I have a, a tendency, it seems to me, as I've been criticized before, going off on tangents. <laughs> so I decided I wouldn't go off on a tangent. This is a teaching sermon. It's a fun sermon. We've done it before. Uh, we'll do it again. One last time. We've talked about epiphanies, right? And epiphany, it's a word that means manifestation, okay? Uh, and an epiphany is when, uh, it, it's personal, when, when you have a God light or a God moment or some sacred 
uh, event occurs to you and you go, ah, now I get it, now I see, now, now I understand what they're talking about. Well, th those are epiphanies. You also have uh, theophanies, all right? Uh, theos, which means God, and phaneros, which means manifestation, so God manifestations, right? And, and, and a theophany uh, would include certain individuals, but more often it seems to me they include uh, more than one person, not always, but certainly, uh, but certainly uh, includes somewhat of a group of people. Now, you read your scriptures carefully, well, not even carefully, certainly probably the best known theophany that we find in the Old Testament at any rate is um, the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, right? God shows up, boom, you get the Ten Commandments, and all the people are somewhat privy to this. They, they see what's going on. This, this holy event seems to overwhelm them and they get a sense of something awe-inspiring is going on, something supernatural, something that is arresting, something that has to do with God. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's a cloud of smoke, there's fire, there's fear. Does that sound familiar? With something you just read earlier? Like from Acts? Always remember that. There's divine revelation. And this happens uh, on the mountain, uh, Sinai. Now note, this is what's significant, that the theophany, I should say any theophany for that matter, only makes sense when it is correctly interpreted, interpreted, interpreted <laughs> uh, by a spokesperson. Got you with me? In other words, theophany, theophany means nothing unless it is correctly <coughs> interpreted. <laughs> there I go again. Understood. <laughs> and in this case, of course, it's Moses who happens to be a prophet. And he's able to, to put in clear form what is going on in this uh, uh, awesome event. And he's able to write it down, put it into intelligible uh, language, what God is saying. Theophanies are recalled, if you remember correctly, uh, in rituals. So you have all sorts of rituals at the church and in Judaism, frankly, probably every religion in the world that they observe to call to mind, and if not call to mind, to reenact a particular um, theophany uh, in, in their religious past. For, if you think of the Lord's Supper, for example, there's a, a, a good example of that. Well, at the Sinai theophany, what happened there is uh, that event and the event of when Moses, remember, who's there at the, uh, the, the Theophany of Sinai, where Moses is also there uh, as a liberator, a freedom fighter, takes the people out of Egypt, takes them across uh, the water, and there they end up having, eventually going to Sinai, and what they end up doing is commemorating that moment of liberation, commemorating that along with the Theophany at Sinai in the great feast of Passover. If you recall, uh, Passover is when the blood of the lamb is spread over the lentils and, and of the people that are living in the land of Goshen, and then the angel, the avenging angel of the Lord, passes over, supposedly, so the Hebrews, uh, not Israelites really, so the Hebrews then are able to leave and, uh, and, and enter into some kind of freedom. And so they celebrate that with the Passover meal. Now apparently, this feast, um, which was celebrated originally perhaps as liberation uh, from Egypt, was also an agrarian festival. And this is something that is so hard to understand and really get a handle on. You know, th these societies in the ancient Near East, they were not 
industrial societies. They were agrarian. And so that, that's what determined their lifeblood, and that what determined the pace of their society. And so you have uh, also at this time uh, a, a, a feast that is going on with the people, probably Hebrews, who are probably living in what is what we call Palestine, and they also are celebrating uh, the incoming of the first sheaf of barley. Now this is not confusing, it's kind of fun. So what happened is you have the, the leadership, as it develops in ancient Israel, they combine this agrarian festival with the celebration of liberation from Egypt and the celebration of, of freedom. And that, that, if you recall, is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because if you recall, when they had to get out of Egypt, they couldn't leaven the bread, and so they just made it real fast. So you have the combination of that, unleavened bread, with the barley harvest, the first sheaf. And then you also have it um, uh, having something to do with, with, with the giving of the law. And we'll talk about that in just a second, because what it talks about, frankly, is the idea of celebrating freedom. Now later what happened is that the Passover feast, Feast of Unleavened <coughs> Bread, um, ended up being connected to what is called the Feast of Weeks. Now this is important. Now follow me. It's not boring. It's kind of neat. The Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks, again, was originally an agrarian festival that celebrated the first harvest in the spring. The <coughs> incoming of, of your, your spring harvest. And that spring harvest coincided seven weeks and one day after the celebration of Passover. With me? So let's see. Seven weeks is what? 49 days. And one day as a holy day to commemorate that would be what? Pentecost. 50. So 50 days after the celebration of unleavened bread or Passover <laughs> is you have the new celebration, which in Greek is called Pentecost. So the celebration of Pentecost in ancient Israel has nothing to do with speaking in tongues, has nothing to do with anything emotional, has nothing to do with anything that has to do with anything that has to do with our feelings. Right? <laughs> Thank you. It only has to do with God's holy work. And so we're going to observe this 50 days after. So that's kind of fascinating. However, by the time of Jesus, the original use of Pentecost as a commemorative uh, moment for the first harvest was abandoned. And it became Pentecost, a time to remember and uh, uh, commemorate the giving of the Ten Commandments. So during the time of Jesus, Pentecost was the time when the Jews celebrated the giving of the law. Right? So, just for the fun of it real quickly, when Moses is up on Mount Sinai, and this theophany occurs, what are the, what's the word, meteorological, is that the word? No, no, uh, atmospheric, is that the word? Geographical, I don't know. What things happen? Well, there's what? Fire, thunder, <coughs> wind, fear, danger, confusion, noise, right? Now, Michelle read uh, what happened on the first Pentecost. And incidentally, and this is not incidentally, uh, it's not coincidental <laughs> that the, uh, um, uh, the followers of Jesus had something happen to them on the day of Pentecost. So on the day of Pentecost, which is a Jewish festival to celebrate the giving of the law, what happens? What did Michelle read? All of a sudden they're gathered together and what happens? There's noise and there's fire. And there's danger, and there's fear, and there's a whirlwind. What does that sound like? Ta-da! The giving of the law. 
So it's exactly the same. Exactly the same. Now, but what does this, and I don't even like this word because it's, it's, it's just been misused. At that first Pentecost, if you want to even read the first Pentecost, there are zillions of years before that of Pentecost. We'll call it this Christian Pentecost. What happens? Well, you have this, this uh, theophany where God shows up in the form of the Spirit. All this turmoil is going on. The people are receiving this, but they don't understand it. So the only way they can understand it is how? To have a human being assume the role of the prophet and interpret it correctly. And that happens to be Peter. So the event of Pentecost would be utterly meaningless were it not for a preacher. Utterly meaningless. The Ten Commandments would be utterly meaningless if it weren't for the preacher, in this case, Moses. Now today, of course, what happens, and certainly I'm not being unkind to anybody, what we have understood Pentecost to be about is Pentecostalism, right? And speaking in tongues, and having this emotional, this deeply uh, physical feeling event where one has this sense of being connected to God and therefore special to God and God interprets and teaches you how to, and I'm not making fun of this, teaches you how to speak and understand the language of angels. And, but that has nothing to do with the original Pentecost. Nothing to do with it. The original Pentecost, the only way it makes sense it's when you have somebody who's sensible to interpret the theophany. And the interpretation of the theophany has absolutely nothing to do with your feelings. It has to do with being sensitive to being able to hear correctly and interpret correctly the advent of God, in this case uh, a theophany of God, into the people's lives and then telling them what it means. That's what a good preacher is supposed to do. That's what a good preacher is supposed to do. It has nothing to do with feelings. It has to do with divine truth. That's the secret. That's the secret. Well, happy Pentecost. If you need to speak in tongues, go right ahead. Uh, and, and I have no problem with that. And I will have Reverend Warmer interpret it for you. Thank you so much. See you downstairs for a, a wonderful um, coffee hour. Please extend the hand of fellowship to Andrew. We wish you well. You'll be just fine and uh, excited for you. This is also the time when we celebrate our Pentecost offering. And uh, Alan, you're going to pass that out right now as we sing our closing hymn. Please, uh, please remain seated. Please remain seated. <laughs>
gracious and heavenly God for these gifts that we have so generously shared with you. We give thee thanks. We pray that they would be used in such a way to manifest our love for you. We give thee thanks for this day. We give thee thanks for your holy word. We give thee thanks for this people. In Christ's name this we pray and may the blessings of Jesus rest upon everybody now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.